Satan's purpose is to divide and conquer. Satan's purpose is to divide. Satan loves to infiltrate our lives. In our culture today, there is an incredible rise of Satanism and demonism all throughout the world. As we look at what is happening in our culture today, we should not be surprised to observe the increase of all of these things that are involved in spiritual warfare because 1 Timothy tells us that the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. Now watch this, giving heed to deceiving spirits and to doctrines of demons. In the ninth chapter of the book of Revelation, John the Revelator tells us that during the tribulation, there's going to be an outpouring of demonology of demons in the tribulation period. I don't know if you've ever read the description of what happens, but when you get a chance sometime, read Revelation 9, 8 through 11, and there you will find a description of what happens when the demons of hell are let loose on planet earth during the tribulation period. Now today, as we move closer to the coming of Jesus Christ and the tribulation period, we are witnessing the rise of demonic activity all around the world. For instance, in Italy, according to CBS News commentator Mark Phillips, there are now 350 trained exorcists working there where there were only 20 10 years ago. Father Thomas Williams says there's an increased interest in the occult, even in Satanism. Where I live in Italy, he wrote, satanic worship is actually on the rise. And this is true in a lot of places in Europe. Satanism is on the rise, demonism is moving forward. And just like Paul wrote to Timothy, in the latter days, this is what's going to happen. And we're seeing it manifest itself in our culture in ways that many of you know about because you're shaking your heads up and down. Now the Bible tells us a great deal about the enemy of our souls. In Ephesians 6.12, for instance, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. John Phillips tells us we should remember when we read that, that our enemies are not people. <laughs> We must see beyond people. Satan may use people to persecute us. They may use people to lie to us or cheat us or hurt us or even kill us. But our real enemy lurks in the shadows of the unseen world, moving people like pawns on the chessboard. And as long as we see people as enemies and wrestle against them, we are spending our time in vain. Now, isn't it true that today in our churches and in our small groups and in our communities, we get focused on the people and we lose sight of where the battle is really being fought. And if we continue to do that, we will continue to lose. We will continue to go backward in our Christian experience. Now, to illustrate how Satan accomplishes what he does in the world today, I paged through the Bible. I remember doing this one day in my office at home, and I underlined every verb I could find that described what Satan does. Now, you know a verb is an action word. A, wor a verb is what says, this is what he does. This is his action. And I just put them all together in one paragraph, and it goes like this. Satan beguiles, he seduces, he opposes, he resists, he deceives, he sows terror, he hinders, he buffets, he tempts, he persecutes, he blasphemes, and a whole lot more that I don't have time to put in the list. All of his activities, every single one of them are deceitful, they're divisive, and they're destructive, and they're aimed at diminishing and defacing the glory of God and the effectiveness of his people. And so many of us today are being victimized by it, unaware that it's even happening, but aware that something is wrong. Now let me tell you some things that I've learned about Satan. First of all, he is the great deceiver. He's the great deceiver. He is, according to John 8, in the words that Jesus gave to a group of Jews who were struggling with his message, he told them that they were the children of their father, the devil, and that they had a hard time with truth because their father's native language was lies. A person's native language is what they speak easily and converse in, what they naturally speak. And ladies and gentlemen, Satan's natural language is lies. 
Revelation 12, 9 refers to him as the one who deceives the whole world, which he does by counterfeiting and camouflaging. He tries to imitate the work of God, and he does it very effectively. He's the great deceiver. He is also the great divider. Did you know that Satan's purpose is to divide and conquer? Satan has always been a divider. When he was cast out of heaven, he divided the angels and he took a third of them with him. He instigated division in the first family, pitting Cain against Abel. In the early church, he entered into the heart of Ananias and motivated him to divide his loyalty between God and money. Wherever you see Satan at work, there's always division. Listen to me carefully. Did you ever wonder why there are so many churches that go through church splits and have all kinds of problems? Uh, it's because Satan is at work in the midst of the church. You say, you mean Satan goes to church? Oh my, yes, he goes to church. I've probably sat next to him a couple of times. <laughs> And he loves to divide the people of God. If we could only understand that, we would step back from our petty differences and realize that we're just playing into the hand of our enemy whose purpose is to divide. What happens in churches is that Satan gets a hold of the tongues of God's people and he uses their tongues to poison the atmosphere of the church. And he does that in families and he does it in workplaces and he does it in communities. Satan's purpose is to divide. He does not know the meaning of unity. He has no concept of unity. His whole strategy is the strategy of division. He's the great deceiver and he's the great divider. And thirdly, he's the great destroyer. In his attempt to destroy the work of God in the universe, specifically on planet Earth, Satan will do anything to destroy God's work. He will delay, he will demolish, he'll dismantle, anything he can do to destroy. People can live their whole life and honor the Lord, and if Satan gets an advantage of them for a moment, and in their weakness of the flesh, they do something that dishonors God, their influence for God is ruined, and Satan is the victor. We ought to pray against him every day. We ought to pray that Satan would have no place in our lives because he comes to deceive, he comes to divide, and he comes to destroy. Well, you say, Pastor Jeremiah, how does he go about this? What does he do? Well, he has several strategies, and I want to tell you a little bit about them because if we don't know our enemy, we're going to lose every battle. So let me tell you what some of his strategies are. Here's his first one. The first strategy Satan has is the strategy of indifference. Satan's cleverest ruse in the modern world is to make us think that he doesn't exist, that he's a figment of the overactive imagination of dreamers and schemers and Hollywood scriptwriters. He wants us to think he is a cartoon character with a cultural role to play as a mischief maker or at worst, a dark imaginary boogeyman who hides in closets and under beds and inhabits our nightmares. Strategy number two is ignorance. That's not a good word. It's just a true word. Next to our passive indifference to his presence in our lives, Satan depends upon our ignorance of his strategies. So one of the problems that we have and one of the reasons why Satan is being so effective, even in Christian circles, is not because we're simply indifferent to him, like he doesn't exist. We're ignorant of how he works. Let me give you the third thing that's true about Satan and how he works. Not only does he work through our indifference and through our ignorance, but he also works through infiltration. Satan loves to infiltrate our lives. Here's a verse of scripture you need to remember. I'll just give you a little phrase out of the verse. It's Ephesians 4, 27, and it says, don't give place to the devil. How many of you know what it means to give place to the devil? You say, well, why would anybody in their right mind ever give place to the devil? We don't do it probably on purpose, but we do it nonetheless. Christians today run the risk of being confronted by his power by allowing things in their lives that should never be allowed in the front door. Proverbs says, can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? <laughs> You say, well, Pastor Jeremiah, what are you talking about? Many Christians today build a fire in their lap with their thought life, 
with their lifestyle choices, with their harboring of sin, with their dabbling in dark practices like astrology and fortune telling. And then they wonder why they get burned, why Satan gets into their life. All he needs is a little beachhead into your life and he'll set up shop as quick as he can. So you don't need to be afraid of him. You need to be prepared to deal with him, but you don't need to be afraid of him. The story of Job teaches us we do not have to be afraid of what he will do. He cannot do anything unless the Lord allows him that freedom. And he only allows that freedom so that we can learn to depend upon him for victory in our lives.